Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Frenzy. Baylor. Well, my sister's at it again. She said, what about a Q&A? Lots of questions. And I was at a cocktail party the other night. Of course I was. Uh, and a lot of people are asking me most of these questions. So a lot of stuff to ask. The thing that's on most people's mind right now is uh, H5N1, the bird flu, the avian flu. We talked a lot about that in other, other uh, sessions, other videos. So one of the, just what do I need to know about avian flu? So uh, H5N1 is, is a, an avian flu that is spread mostly in wild birds. It's been causing a lot of outbreaks in poultry and U.S. dairy cows. There have been uh, two human transmissions in the U.S., one with a uh, dairy worker and one with a poultry worker. Uh, the CDC thinks it's pretty low risk right now. The issue is that it get it, it tra it's very easily transmitted between in poultry. So many many uh, chickens had to be called. But it's got into dairy cattle, which made everyone nervous because you know a mammal and and they were spread in the in the herd. And then these two cases where it got into people, but it doesn't seem to be able to transmit person to person. So it was a one time infection. Person got it. And uh, handled it and and, um, uh, and didn't transmit it. So the concern, of course, is that it will change somehow and adapt so it can be spread, and that's the big concern why we're following it. What are the symptoms of avian flu? Well, they're so much. They're like everything else. They're in in people. It's uh, like a, a flu syndrome. It's just more severe. The in poultry, uh, they actually develop respiratory symptoms and they have decreased egg production. Now, uh, many of them actually die from the, the disease. Um, in cattle, uh, what happens is they, they seem to get more like a respiratory disease and their, uh, their milk is discolored. So th those are kind of the main things for poultry and cattle and in humans. Does the flu vaccine work against avian flu? Well, probably not. There's some cross immunity. Remember, each year we change the the uh, the flu vaccine based on what the circulating uh, neuraminidase and hemagglutin are. That's the H and the N. Uh, this H5 is is very different, and so if we we're really not quite protected, but the uh, many groups are working on having a being prepared for a vaccine. So vaccine production is going on that could be brought to bear if is if needed. Is Tamiflu a treatment? Well, according to the World Health Organization, in most studies, Tamiflu should minimize those symptoms. Uh, it works on the neuraminidase, uh, so it should be effective even for H5N1. Here's one person asked, how is bird flu typically spread? Well, it's, in, it's spread respiratory between in, in poultry, or when, when humans have contacted, it's been because they've been in contact with a sick or a dead animal, or they've been handlers of poultry or livestock. So it's direct, direct, it's direct contact uh, in those cases when it, did, when it has gotten into humans. How, how can cows get bird flu? It's a good question. Because cows don't fly, at least I haven't seen very many been flying around. But if, there, if there's a dead bird on, you know, that's in a, on a farm or something like that, and the virus is being shed, if, they, if the cow, had, you know, gets contact, uh, their saliva or mucus or through feces, it's very likely the cow acquires it that way. Uh, one was like, I also already mentioned, but is bird flu contagious person to person? So far, no. Uh, there's been no evidence of sustained human-to-human -human transmission, and we hope it stays that way. Because if it does, if it starts jumping between people, it's going to be, uh, it could be another, you know, pandemic. How would you categorize the risk of H5, H5N1 transmitting a human? Right now, we all think it's low. Uh, but, I, you know, I'd say in people who are working with dairy cattle or poultry, it's low to moderate. And they need to be very careful about uh, wearing uh, protective clothing. Is it safe to drink milk or ingest beef from the grocery store? Well, Pasteurization of milk kills anything that's in there, so the virus, even if there was virus in there, it'd be inactivated. Uh, if you were to go onto a, uh, if you had unpasteurized milk, like you were on a farm and you got unpasteurized milk and an animal was sick, that would be a risk. Uh, they're not, you know, they're supposed to call those animals, but uh, yeah, so I would only drink pasteurized milk. Is it safe to eat chicken eggs or chicken because of bird flu? And the FDA says both chicken and eggs are safe to eat if properly cooked. So again, if, you know, heat will kill the virus, so uh, no worries there as long as you're cooking things. 
Uh, how can people protect themselves from bird flu? Well, one, if you see something dead on the street, don't go pick it up. Don't kiss any dead birds or dead animals. Roadkill is to be avoided. avoided. Um, and if you're working with them, you know, with, in, with poultry or, or you're working with uh, potentially infected cattle, you should be wearing an N95 mask and goggles and gloves and all that kind of stuff, protective clothing, just like you would any other respiratory virus. Uh, somebody asked, do you think avian flu will be the next pandemic? Well, you know, that's what everybody's worried about. That's a giant maybe. Uh, it would have to acquire the uh, ability to go from human to human. And, you know, that could if it jumped, let's say, into swine, or it just could if it mutated, uh, but we hope not. Uh, and we're following that. Obviously, that's a big thing. Uh, so one person asked me, you know, you've mentioned TEFI a few times. What is that? That's the TEFI stands for the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute. Uh, it was uh, funded by the governor after COVID started to prepare Texas for the next pandemic. It is, uh, it's responsible for training work, uh, healthcare workers provides a lot of the early detection studies that we're working with them on, looking at viruses and wastewater. Also, it's uh, trying to aggregate data to communicate and, and uh, provide uh, tools and data and knowledge for institutions to be able to deal with if there's another pandemic. So speaking of that, I just wanted to point out there was a paper by the, uh, that group uh, led by our own Dr. Maressa, whose laboratory has really, I think, really pioneered the use of wastewater to look at viruses. Uh, they were the ones that did it in Houston. The CDC is trying to do their uh, the same kind of uh, work that we're doing, although ours is not just uh, PCR and looking for specific viruses. This is sort of uh, a, an agnostic approach where you just amplify all the viruses and look at it, and they've discovered some really interesting things. They just reported that H5N1 is detectable in nine cities. Now remember, in Texas, Remember, we've never done this before, so we don't know how often that happens, that there's, you know, bird flu around in a wild bird that dies and gets in the wastewater. So we don't really know, but it is interesting that nine cities have had uh, H5N1 detected. Uh, and the interesting thing is uh, 19 of the 23 monitored sites had at least one detection event, and it seemed like... It, at some point, it became even more common than, than flu, so the, the standard seasonal flu. So here's some examples of a North Texas uh, wastewater sample where H5N1 signature is actually higher than seasonal flu. So I think the real insight is there's a lot more H5N1 in our wastewater that we know about. We think it's probably contamination by either uh, birds or cattle. Uh, it's also possible, we d doubt it, that it's because it's coming from a human source, but based on the sequencing, it's really hard to tell from that. So there's still no evidence that there's, you know, spreading man to man, but it just shows there's a fair number of animals or whatever is getting in the wastewater that have it. Okay, switching to RSV. Do adults get RSV? Well, yes, older adults, especially immunocompromised adults, are at high risk, and that's why the vaccine it was so important. First time we had an RSV vaccine last year, and you should get it if you're over the age of 60. And uh, they say, what are the, what, one person asked, what are the symptoms of RSV and the treatment? Well, RSV appears like a, you know, upper respiratory infection, looks like, a, you know, like the flu. And generally, uh, the best thing is to get a vaccine, but home, home care is just use uh, over-the-counter stuff. You know, it's, it's symptomatic care. Here's a good one. Is the 23-24 flu season over? Please, God, let it be over. Uh, yes, and, and generally flu cases have been steadily decreasing. I've shown you the data for that. Uh, it usually generally ends in the spring, and it's, it's ending now. Also got a few leftover COVID questions. Is it possible the pandemic isolation impacted children's immune system? So that was interesting. By keeping everybody at home, do you think that was a problem for children's immune system? And actually it was interesting Remember, flu disappeared for the years when everyone was isolated, and then we all came out and started walking around again, uh, pretending there was no problem, and everybody got, like, uh, common colds. So I don't think it, it, it didn't impair anybody's immune system, but it did uh, reduce the number of antigens, in other words, the number of exposure to viruses during that time, but your immune system is all, it, it doesn't have any long-term impact on your immune system. Uh, when will the next COVID shots be available? Well, they haven't changed yet. <laughs> 
We'll see in the fall, but right now it's still the same booster that's been around. Uh, so if you haven't had an updated vaccine and you're over the age of 60 and it's been eight months or so, you should probably start thinking about, get, about getting another one because there's still a fair amount of COVID that's, that's around worldwide. Uh, what should I know about COVID or other virus numbers before going on a trip outside the U.S.? Well, it's always a good idea to see what the, what the incidence of COVID is uh, in other countries uh, before traveling, but the main thing is just be updated on your vaccines. I still, when I go abroad, take, uh, uh, you know, the, I take a couple of test kits just to make sure and take a, a, I take Paxlovid with me just in case I get sick. Okay, uh, COVID vaccinations seem to be low. How can this be increased? Well, there was an interesting study in China that found that <laughs> grandchildren, bossing grandparents around were very effective at getting them to get vaccinated. So like many things, it was like this with uh, uh, smoking cessation, kids and families are very effective at getting their parents and grandparents. Uh, and so there was a big educational program in China to teach the kids uh, about the importance of vaccines. I, I wish we would do that here. Uh, anyway. So it's a really, family, family members can really influence others. I got a couple other uh, just out there about measles. Should I get measles vaccine booster before I go abroad this summer? So if you have had a documented live uh, attenuated measles vaccine in the 60s, you don't need to be revaccinated. But most people don't remember what they got. So people were vaccinated prior to 1968 uh, and don't know what their sources probably should get revaccinated, at least what one one dose of an attenuated measles vaccine before you travel. So there's one other interesting question. Uh, in Texas, do we need to worry about diseases from ticks? Uh, where I was in the northeast and east, there's, yeah, it's a lot. But in Texas, there's actually a very low incidence of tick disease. Uh, Lyme disease is still the uh, most common one, but, but it's, very, it's not very common in Texas. All right, I went in today with a bunch of shout outs, of course. I want to shout out for all of our 2024 graduates who received their diplomas this week. It's always an exciting event. People actually be, get their MD and start being doctors or, or doctor, get their PhDs or their counseling degrees. Uh, it was really great. It was held in uh, the George R. Brown Convention Center. Big thanks and shout out to Nobel Laureate Bill Kalin who gave the Johnny e. Whitmore Lecture Commencement Address. And earlier in the day, uh, two of our uh, students were commissioned in the U.S. Army, so congratulations to them. All in all, a terrific day. Uh, wonderful weekend. I hope you have a great time this weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.